Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Now that the cleanup has begun, the equally difficult task of answering the legal and engineering questions intensifies. We'll look at the latest in the Hard Rock Hotel collapse, for which the week began with an implosion along Rampart Street. We'll also examine the performances by first responders in the local news media as their ability to react to a sudden disaster was tested. In politics, we will discuss some of the behind-the-scenes groups, including a Baton Rouge power broker. Our Future Watch segment surveys a college course in cloud computing. And move over, Dallas Cowboys. Guess who is really America's team now? Joining us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources. Tyler Bridges, political reporter of the Times-Picayune, the New Orleans Advocate, Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter, and Dave Cohen, News Director, WWL Radio. And we're going to stick with Dave for a follow-up on what's going on over at the Hard Rock Hotel collapse site in this, you know, these days following. Well, the mayor has laid out priorities now. After we got through the phase that they were most concerned about initially, which was the leaning construction cranes. There was great fear. Many people were amazed they didn't fall on their own. And now that they've blown those to smaller pieces and the city feels like they're in a more secure location and they're not going to fall on their own, uh, they can look forward now to what comes next. And those priorities, of course, the mayor laid out early in the week were finding the two bodies mm -hmm. that are in the rubble. And long-term after cutting apart the pieces of the crane, getting the one that's stuck in Rampart Street out, getting the one that's hanging over Canal Street off. Her long-term goal, she made very clear, is to have an entire demolishing of that site, taking it down to the dirt so there's absolutely nothing mm -hmm. left. She says that the law is on her side, and as long as the city controls that location as a dangerous situation and under the declaration of emergency, she feels like she can move to that point where they can take it down to nothing. There's been a lot of speculation on if the developer, if Hard Rock, if anybody is going to want to be associated with the project going forward and wants to salvage anything, mm -hmm. she said, salvage nothing, take it down. I don't think it's going to be quite that simple, though. There's going to be a lot of factors that influence that. Even looking that. at the structure, the bottom six floors really do still look sturdy and stable. I mean, I would take it would take engineer <clears throat> upon engineer to say, yes, it's okay, get rid of that top part and, and continue with your base. But, but who would then who want, to would say, want to do that? Okay, I, we're going to take that risk. Even if every engineer says, no, it's fine. The challenge is also demolishing those top 12 floors and getting them cleared out mm -hmm. while being able to preserve that base. The mayor really seems to want to take it all down. Now, from an evidentiary standpoint, we've already had one court order issued to preserve evidence at the scene, so you can't demolish it without going through the courts now, because obviously in both the civil and criminal investigations, there are concerns about making sure they figure out what happened before they do any of that. That was another of the mayor's priorities, of course, is determining what caused all of this. But there's a lot of speculation and question now, will anything ever be rebuilt on that site? I think it's a lot more likely it'll happen if they take it down to the ground and start completely over. Dave, when people were watching, as we did mm -hmm. on television, after the implosion, and if you listen to the commentators on television, it sounded like it didn't go well. You know, they saying, well, here's this thing fell in the street. You, you got another thing hanging over. But yet an hour or so later, when the officials commented, they said, hey, it went well. You know, the fire chief was adamant. He said that's exactly what we wanted to happen. And I think he was speaking in slightly broader terms because never did he say prior to it, we want one piece to come down and impale Rampart Street <laughs> and break a sewer line. He never told us that's what he wanted. <laughs> and he never said, I want part of it still hanging over Canal Street. But his justification was he had said it's all going to fall within the footprint of the project. And he was including Canal and Rampart Streets as part of that footprint. And he had said that he wanted the crane closest to Canal Street to hook on the existing building and be secured up against the damaged building. And that happened. Now, he never told us, I want part of it still dangling over mm -hmm. Canal. But his justification was, it's all within the footprint. Nothing fell on any other buildings. Nothing fell on the Sanger particularly, which was their biggest concern because of its proximity and its size. And they feel like, and clearly, that was seen this week, 
that everything is secure and stable enough because they started to open up streets. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, anything more than a block away, they started reopening. So they are no longer concerned about those cranes obviously falling or any of the other dangling mats of concrete or anything else getting off of that footprint at this time, which is very welcome news to the businesses in that area. Right. Well, certainly with that impl the implosion of the, of the cranes, um, it, they are able to control it a little bit more. Before, there was just absolutely no con control over where those things could potentially go. But they still emphasize this building is really very unstable. I mean, oh, very absolutely. unstable. Absolutely. The footprint itself remains an unstable situation, but they feel like outside of that. You know, those cranes, it was an 18-story structure. Those cranes had to be significantly taller than those 18 floors to be able to manipulate materials up above and pick things up and move them around. So if those cranes had fallen without their controlling that fall, they had no idea where they could go or would go, taking out entire buildings or blocks. But bottom line, they say that the demolition of the cranes was a success to the point where there's no longer a danger. They can now cut the remaining pieces that are on the street, in the street, hanging over the street. They can cut those into smaller pieces and haul them away. And ultimately now, you know, a lot more of the questions hopefully will start to get answered. But we had additional lawsuits filed this week. We're going to see more lawsuits over time. I have a feeling up until the one year post, we're going to see more and more lawsuits. And it's going to be just an evolutionary situation. And you know, the question is going to be with the price tag that the, the mayor said the city alone is spending $400,000 a day to secure the site in the police and the fire and the rescue crews and everything else it's taking administratively. Five million dollars the developer had to pay just to bring those cranes down. I mean, the price tag is going to be astronomical to take the entire building down. Right. And so, and once you know, a good point was made with the fact that the city is really raking up some bills right now. So who's going to be paying for this? It's not a FEMA type of situation. Well, the mayor was careful. She said the responsible party. She did not identify the responsible party or parties. But it's That's not what Horbrock. years of court will determine. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But it's not Horbrock. I mean, Horbrock was going to just be more of a, a, a management name. company, a, a name. And Horbrock did, the... Hard Rock did come out this week, though, and issue a statement saying that they were going to assist, that they were, while they had not actually been involved in the development, and really were just hanging their name on the building, uh, they said they're going to contribute both financially to the recovery effort, to helping the businesses surrounding that area survive and hopefully eventually thrive, because they still do business in the city, and they said they still want to have a hotel in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be that one, though. But, well, you know, if you want to think, an example of the future, if you think of the World Trade Center, and we all know what a rubble that was. That was two buildings. And look at today, a handsome new building that's there. I don't think it's going to necessarily follow that there'll never be another building there. Uh, I think it's going to almost be like a challenge. Yes, we will put another building there. But it's. Uh, but look what happened in New York, and which was far worse than what you know, the challenge we have here. Right. Obviously, the motivation different in a terror attack versus a tragic accident. But I think you're right. I mean, ultimately, that's too valuable a piece mm -hmm. of real estate not to be put back into commerce at mm -hmm. some point. But the question is, how long will it take both through the because of the investigations, because of the litigation and before someone does step up and say, we've got this, we're going to put this site back in? Well, it's certainly something that has really monopolized our interest now for two weeks. Um, your take, Errol, on how did the local media do and the first responders to this disaster? I think both responded brilliantly. I mean, you know, for all the criticism that the news media get routinely, I thought they did a really good job considering this was on a Saturday morning when a, a lot of media are at skeleton uh, crews or have a lot of competition. I know just at Dave's shop with the uh, with WWL radio, they had the uh, LSU game that af afternoon. It was election day. Election day. Plus, day. plus they had right. statewide elections. And so there was a lot of news that was supposed to be covered on what's usually a slow news day and then to have to mobilize for all of that. And the other thing that's, uh, that I think helps the news media is that essentially everybody's a photographer now. You know, everybody was carrying, you know, walking around. And indeed, I think the first images that most of us saw was that from, first video yeah, from somebody's video, somebody's eye camera, yeah. and why they happened to be looking right at that way, right at that moment, but, but, but they got or it. Or if that they way. heard something. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that was the image. And so there were a lot more uh, TV uh, 
uh, camera people out there, and so they can respond quicker. And so I thought that the media did a, a good job considering, you know, the challenges they had uh, being divided off so many different ways. As far as the first responders, maybe one day we'll find out somebody didn't do something that they should have. But from what we've seen so far, it looks like everybody responded impressively. And I guess the man of the hour so far has been Tim McConnell, mm -hmm. uh, who's the fire, fire chief. chief. And why is it the fire chief has become the spokesman? And probably because fire departments deal with those kind of rescues and demolitions. But he seems to have done a, a steady job. He's the one that people stand behind in the, in the rally, and he's been the spokesman. So it's good that there's that kind of competition. So I think the combination of the two have done a very good job. Yeah. And in those early days, they were doing updates multiple times a day. Um, that's kind of tapered off now. Um, not so much, but they really were on top of it, keeping all of us informed, news media and the, the public at large. Yeah, well, I mean, Tim McConnell rose to the occasion because initially the top concern, obviously, was search and rescue, was making sure yeah. that as many people who could have gotten out did get out and that they found anyone who was still in there. And that's obviously the fire department's role. And he embraced it. He delivered it confidently. And I think he inspired people with hope. Uh, and you could actually see and feel the emotion when they did make the announcement that they were shifting from a search and recovery, I mean, search and rescue mission to a search and recovery. When he had to admit they were giving up on finding anybody else alive, you know, I think that people really felt for him and felt with him on that and how difficult that had to be for him to make that decision and to announce it. Quite a tragedy, and uh, we'll be hearing about it and discussing it. Um, for a long time to come. Absolutely. There's so many legal issues that are going to be involved, but also we want to find out what caused this right. and so that it doesn't happen again. And some of the lawsuits get at that. Some of the lawsuits get at helping those who are economically damaged by the entire sure. situation. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the lawsuits are going to be wrongful death. And I think eventually, depending on where the evidence leads, we could have a murder charge before it's over, if not a negligent homicide charge or something along those lines, if some of the allegations that have been bantered about, unproven, start to prove to be true. Uh, if there was someone who intentionally did wrong things that led to these deaths. Remains to be seen. We'll find out. All right, Dave and Errol, thanks a lot. Tyler, over to you. We mentioned, oh, by the way, there happened to be a governor's race that day, too, which, of course, has led to uh, a runoff between our incumbent governor, John Bell Edwards, and then Eddie Rispone businessman, a contractor, right, from Baton Rouge. Right. So what's their strategy, the, each of them, so that they can come out on top? Right. Uh, there are three national uh, handi <coughs> political handicappers. Each one has said that the race is a toss-up, hmm. and I think each candidate can legitimately claim a, a path to victory. For John Bell Edwards, he got 46.6% in the runoff, so he only needs 3.5 more percent percentage points more to win. What he would be looking to do would be to boost the turnout of African-American voters. Uh, normally, uh, I don't want to get too much into the numbers, but normally they would account for, uh, hopefully from a Democratic point of view, about 30 percent of the overall vote. They were only 26.5 percent of the overall vote uh, on that Saturday election. If they could boost that a couple points, uh, that would help John Bell Edwards also. He's particularly looking to get uh, to turn some of the uh, voters who voted for Ralph Abraham, the congressman from Northeast Louisiana, who finished third in the in the race, to get perhaps 10 to 15 percent of those voters, those would be white voters, uh, to vote for him, and also pick up a few of the uh, uh, the votes of the uh, the minor candidates, perhaps uh, a point there. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Eddie Rispone, the businessman, as you mentioned, uh, he wants to make sure that everybody who voted Republican in the primary, which was uh, 51.8 percent of all the voters voted for a Republican, that they vote a, for a Republican again in the runoff. And that would be telling everybody, I'm a Republican. Trump, I'm with Trump. He's a Republican. John Bell Edwards is a Democrat. Of course, Abraham is a Republican. So what does John Bell have to do to persuade those voters for Abraham who voted Republican to switch over and go for a Democrat? I mean, he's, you know, he is in a red state. Right. Well, he's already started that effort. He has been up in northeast Louisiana reminding uh, the people up there that during the primary, Eddie Rispone launched some very, very harsh attacks against Ralph Abraham uh, that can probably accurately be described as unfair attacks, particularly when 
uh, Rispone said that uh, Abraham had voted in Congress 300 times with uh, Nancy Pelosi, the House Democratic Speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, some Republicans took, particularly got, uh, took offense at that attack by Rispone and then declared their allegiance for Abraham. So we've already started seeing ads from uh, the Edwards campaign reminding voters of the terrible things that Rispone said about Abraham and Ed Abraham's complaints about those ad, that, that ad attack. So that becomes a geographical, emotional ploy then that, hey, maybe you voted for Abraham because he represents you in Congress. Maybe you voted for Abraham because he's from your community. But that doesn't mean you have to vote for Rispone just because they're both Republicans. Yeah, Marcia, the key question in this election, uh, the, the public, uh, uh, public opinion surveys show that John Bell Edwards is liked by a majority of the people in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So the question that voters are faced, are you going to vote for the guy you, most people like, or are you going to vote for the political party, Republican, that you prefer? Or are you going to vote for Donald Trump? Uh, and he's playing the Trump <coughs> card fairly, fairly strong. Just about every commercial that Rispone has has, uh, has Trump. You know, and, 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 you know, and Trump is saying things like, uh, you know, he put us in the, this is the most taxed state in the country and all that. And, you know, some people need to remember that Edwards increased taxes because taxes were cut so low that we, uh, that the state needed to recover. That was all those sessions that when he first became governor. Well, it's also yeah. worth pointing out, as John Bell Edwards does, is that those taxes were approved by the Republican-controlled mm -hmm. right. legislature. Um, that's not something that Eddie Rispone wants to spread the word. But the, the and we knew that. Was, I remember like being on the show when that was happening a, a few years ago. You can kind of see the next you election coming forward. up. All right. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. We've got to pass these taxes, but you know you're going to pay for it uh, at election time. You know, the other curiosity is is um, Edwards really needs to increase the black vote. And, but you just wonder how black politics is changing. That I don't know if it was like it was in the 70s when you had groups like Soul and Bold and Coup because there was, there was less novelty in having black elected officials. There. there was more of a mission and more of a cause back then. Now it's fairly common, and I don't see that same sort of street organization that you used to have in the black community, like Bill Jefferson and his progressive Democrats. And so t to get them out, I mean, there's probably more pockets of smaller groups that you have to work than there used to be. So it's probably more difficult. So turnout, turnout is going to really be an issue. What, what was the turnout for this past statewide? Was the overall about? was 45 percent, which was higher than in the governor's race of 2015, but again, the, the turnout of African-American voters was right, down a bit, right. and that's a key point that John Bell Edwards is going to have to address. Okay. All righty. Thanks a lot, Tyler. I'm going to move over to Don now. Future Watch, cloud computing. For those of us who barely even know what computing is, <laughs> well, what is cloud computing? Join the club. I'll do my best with this. If you're an IT person, you're going to sit there and laugh at me, but most of our business, if you go on a website, that has a lot of data. If you're shopping, if you're on Entergy paying your bills, a lot of data is often powered by Amazon Web Services or AWS. When you think about Amazon, you're probably thinking about getting your groceries delivered or watching television or whatever. Their biggest bread and butter is AWS, their cloud-based services. Um, they need people to help operate. It, so it's, it's other companies' websites that are running on this platform. Mm -hmm. Other companies, other individuals. If you need more than a basic spreadsheet, you're going to somebody's cloud-based platform, whether it's Amazon or another company's. Amazon makes more than 50% of their revenue off of this platform, so you can imagine it's, it's, it's huge. And they need people who understand how to navigate it, how to troubleshoot it, how to operate it. Um, and that's where their educate team comes in. So they have teamed up with educators around the nation and develop, built out a curriculum that trains people in communicating in this language of AWS. In the state of Louisiana last year, there were 1,455 job postings looking for people with AWS skills. So it's a, it's a need and it's a very big job base. It's the, the demand's gone up 175%. So Back a couple of years ago, somebody from the Louisiana Workforce Commission met with Amazon and heard about this need and took that need then to GNO Inc. who said, ooh, we could be on to something. GNO Inc. and the Workforce Commission met with Delgado and said, can we get on board with this? Delgado jumped at the chance, as did the rest of the state's community college systems. We became the first state to offer a degree in 
AWS services with the Amazon curriculum. A two-year degree. A two-year degree. And it, uh, as people at GNO Inc. told me this week, it really is a company, a big company like Amazon doubling down on an associate's degree being all you need to have a fabulous job with career mobility and a ladder to climb up. Uh, most of the jobs that, that are being posted of the, the, the ones I just mentioned, the 1,624 that were posted for the first month, six months of this year, are jobs that pay $76,000 a year or more. They're stable, good jobs with benefits where there's room to grow. Um, they're software developers, website designers, cloud services managers, IT people all over the place. Um, and it is happening at Delgado. It's also happening in large metro areas around the nation. Los Angeles, California was one of the first cities to do it across their community college system. But this is the next big tech job development thing to happen. So yeah. Delgado is offering a program to go for this uh, two-year degree. What about the other community colleges? In they, the ha they are coming on board with it now. Dave? Yeah, it reminds me of 20, 25 years ago when Microsoft exactly. was emerging and they desperately needed people trained Who in Windows. Who understood it. And so that they could help install Windows, maintain computers, sh troubleshoot and things like that. And they had set up classes that didn't require any actual degree. It wasn't, it wasn't right. even an associate's degree, let alone a bachelor's degree, where you could go and get training in all these Windows classes. And I know people who went through it 25 years ago, who make six figures now, still doing the same kind right. of thing. Well, just like Microsoft Word and Microsoft Office are now just prereqs. If you're going to work in an office anywhere, you need to know how to use that. If you're going to work IT anywhere, you need to understand AWS. Right. And it also trans it, it works across other people's platforms, Is this being too. offered now? Because we it need to wrap this up. It is being offered now. So people just need to call Delgado mm -hmm. and see what's being offered and how yep. to enroll. Next generation jobs Great. right here. Great she job. sounds Thanks like she knows her IT stuff. I, I hope so. Because, <laughs> well, wow. <laughs> All righty. Tyler, back over to you in the back and talking to uh, elections a bit. There's some behind the scenes group, and particularly there's one real big power broker uh, that's involved in state politics. Yeah, Marcia, we talk a lot about the candidates, but there are now are these third-party groups that play major roles in the elections and in the governor's race. In the primary, folks undoubtedly saw uh, a TV ad by a group called Truth in Politics, where it was a woman named Juanita Washington uh, spoke into the camera and talked about how uh, a senior aide to the governor had sexually harassed her, and she made uh, she said some unkind things about the governor. And that was uh, produced by or uh, by a group, as I mentioned, called Truth and Politics. And the guy behind that is Lane Grigsby. He's a Baton Rouge businessman and mega donor who, to his chagrin, has become a story because in a state senate race, uh, he uh, said, "I'm the kingmaker," and uh, tried to get the state senate candidate out of the race in favor of another candidate, and promised this guy uh, he would help help him get elected to a, a judgeship. That all became public. And it turns out that Lane Grigsby, this businessman, is also very close to Eddie Rispone, who is the Republican candidate for governor. And they have been friends and associates for a while. He was sort of a mentor to Rispone, wasn't he? Absolutely. In the contracting field. Yeah, and Lane Grigsby has been a guy who has been throwing a lot of money around and often has done very negative ads. Uh, to uh, end the careers of people he does not like. He's a conservative businessman. And there's, and there's speculation that those ads in particular with a black woman telling us not to vote for John Bell Edwards could have contributed to that low African-American voter turnout because that ad was everywhere. Yeah, it was. It definitely was. So basically in elections there's a whole lot going on that we're not seeing. Yeah, and, and we're, we, we already had been seeing a, a Democratic group uh, called Gumbo Pac. Mm -hmm. They were in the governor's race four years ago. They've come back. They've been doing negative ads against the Republicans, and we're going to see even more groups come in in the final uh, weeks of this gubernatorial race. Which means a lot more television ads, too. Yes. We're already seeing a lot. <laughs> it's hard to believe there's going to be more, but there will be. Okay, we got to wrap up now, and we're going to do that with Dave in the good note. Saints are America's team? Well, if you look at the numbers for the TV ratings for this season of the NFL, you see that three of the highest television ratings nationwide were for games involving the New Orleans Saints, and it didn't matter who the opponent was. People are clearly tuning in to see the Saints play football. We talked with the chief operating officer of the Saints, Ben Hales, who admits he's a little biased, mm -hmm. but he says their research shows not only are the Saints huge for the networks in terms of revenue nationwide because of huge ratings, but they also enjoy the highest rating locally 
of any team in the NFL in their own city. So of the 32 markets where there are NFL teams, Saints fans are a much larger sure, portion. remember when there were blackouts the because they didn't sell enough <laughs> right. tickets that the games weren't even on locally? That's right. And there were almost riots when, mm -hmm. the, when, the team, when the games were blacked out. But they say that, and they have other anecdotal evidence, merchandise sales across the NFL, and a number of other indicators that he believes the Saints now are America's team. And others have pointed out that people have some fatigue with the Patriots who had kind of claimed that title from the Cowboys because... Well, the Patriots win the AFC year after year after year after year. People are kind of tired of them always winning. And there's been some negativity nationwide associated with the Cowboys. So, you know, it's still a good argument to have. But the Saints, and I think most of the Houdat Nation would argue, the Saints are now America's team. A fun team to watch, but sometimes a nail-biting <laughs> team to watch, too. So well, if somebody's course, tuning in, it's always a good game. And, of course, everybody knows the referees hate the Saints. Right. America may love them, but the refs clearly hate Look them. at the power Saints <laughs> fans showed with the Super Bowl, with the no-show bowl. How they were able to actually affect the ratings negatively on purpose by getting their fans not to watch the Super Bowl. It, it, New Orleans, the Saints get a 50 share. Half of all televisions that are on during that time That's are enormous. watching the Saints game. That No other market does that happen and no other programming does that happen. Also number one fan base, according to somebody I can't recall <laughs> what. But of the countdown, who that nation number one. All right, time to look ahead. E. City Park announced this week that Bob Becker, who's been uh, the superintendent for 18 years, is retiring. He's going to retire uh, uh, next spring and they announced they're going to get a, uh, a national headhunting firm uh, to start doing interviews. But he had a, a major impact over that time, including getting the park through the uh, uh, through uh, Katrina, yeah. not only the revival, but just the the overall growth. So Bob Becker is absolutely yeah. wonderful. He was at Audubon before he went out over right. to City Park. Great guy. I hope he has a wonderful retirement. Mm -hmm. We're going to miss him. Tyler. So Lane Grigsby, who we were talking about several minutes ago, I've got a major profile of him coming out in The Advocate on Sunday that really goes into depth of who he is uh, and his influence on elections. All right. We'll be looking for that. Don. It's not just Saints fever in New Orleans, it's Pelicans fever, too. They have their home opener tonight. Um, and we shall no see. Zion. Once, no once Zion. Zion comes back, I think it's really going to be, they're going to be a force to contend with. But, but they, were, they were very impressive Tuesday against mm -hmm. the defending champions. Right on overtime. Yeah, right back yeah. and stay. Uh, on a happy note, while so many shows have been canceled or there's so much uncertainty about what's going on at the Sanger, the Mahalia Jackson Theater is stepping up. They're mm -hmm. moving some of the productions over there. So while we don't know if and when anytime soon the Sanger may reopen, we do know that some of these productions are not going to be totally lost and people can go to Mahalia Jackson to see them. All righty. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys, for being here. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Yeah.